Thanks to Soltech Solutions for sponsoring this episode of On The Ledge. Without their help, I couldn't bring you all this planty chat. I love working with brands that I've tried out and I can truly recommend. And that's certainly the case with Soltech Solutions. I can tell you from personal experience that their lights are superior quality, sturdy, stylish and effective. Soltech Solutions' fabulous customer service means you won't be left in the dark when it comes to buying great grow lights. Choose from their range of track lights, pendant style lights, or a simple bulb that will screw into most standard light fittings for setup that takes just moments. Check out Soltech Solutions' range of lights now at soltechsolutions.com and get 15% off with the code on the ledge. That's soltechsolutions.com. Enter code on the ledge for 15% off. Whether your plants are on the windowsill, in the greenhouse, or under a grow light, Welcome, it's On The Ledge Podcast. I'm your host, Jane Perrone, and in this week's show, I talk to the newly elected chairman of the British Cactus and Succulent Society, Greg Bulmer, and we hear from listener Andrew. Thanks for joining me, whether this is your 200th episode or your first. Welcome to On The Ledge. It's pretty relaxed around here. Sorry if there's a bit of soil on the ground. That's fairly standard. Thanks to Brittany, Amanda and Kyleen, who all became Patreon subscribers this week or upgraded their existing tier. Unlocking extra content, ad-free versions and the first 50 episodes ever made of On The Ledge way back in 2017. Find out how to join the Patreon clan at my show notes at janeperone.com. With more than 3,000 members, the British Cactus and Succulent Society is one of the biggest plant societies in the UK. It's a society which has been extremely successful over the years, uh, holding all kinds of events for cactus and succulent lovers. And I'm a member. I'll declare that interest straight away. So when a new chairman got elected recently, I thought it would be valuable to get him on the show to talk all things cactus and succulent, as well as the future of the BCSS. I'm Greg Bulmer, and I'm the chairman of the British Cactus and Succulent Society, and an avid lover of any kind of plant that's succulent. Congratulations, first of all, on your election. Let's start off by finding out a little bit about you. Are you hoping to inject a little bit of youthful vim and vigour to the BCSS management? Yeah, I, I, I want to yeah open... The society up to, to, to any age, of course, but yeah, I, I am, as you say, probably on the on the younger age of your average branch meeting, and uh, that's that's always been the case, and quite often that that still is the case, and I can envisage that being the case maybe for a few more years still. There's a clear interest in plants amongst young people. Uh, lots of people, you know, kind of describe themselves as plant daddies and plant mummies. You know, they've they've, they've got their flat, and just because they live in you know, in a city centre or in, in shared housing, etc., doesn't mean at all that um, plants aren't for them. And I think for a lot of people in a lot more kind of digital, isolated age, plants offer the ability for you to care for something that is actually organic and alive and living. And so, yeah, I kind of, I want to share that, that the passion I've had for, you know, my, my, most of my my life, I, I've had an interest in plants. You know, I, I came to cacti and succulents when I was, I was 17. Uh, that's when I joined the society. It coincided with me, you know, had my free plants on the uh, on the windowsill, and I just wanted to know more. And yes, the society kind of opened the door to how actually there's there's more than just you know a tall spiky one and, and a round spiky one, and there's round uh, non spiky ones and, and round tall ones, and then and then and then you grow into it. And um, 
you know, pardon the pun, and yeah, yeah and it's opened my mind to how, how there's thousands and thousands of different plants and how they're all different and suit different environments. Um, and often these environments can have kind of a co-incubation with, with, with our homes. So yeah, as, as part of my chairmanship, I would like to kind of expose uh, just just how versatile our plants are, both in a greenhouse and on the windowsill, or in a coal frame, or in a bright off- office. And yeah, I'd like to share my passion for that. I think it's one of these things where it's a good balance between appreciating those older members and their vast experience, but also not making younger members feel like they're not part of things just because, as you say, they don't have a massive greenhouse with, you know, hundreds of one particular genus or something. You know, there is room for everyone in the society. And certainly when I've been to events, you know, I've been made very welcome and I do like to sort of... um just drain the brains of those older members with loads of experience because that's what I'm there for to learn which is great have you got a particular type of cactus or succulent that you're particularly fond of or that you specialize in or are you a bit of a a jack of all trades so I suppose my my journey through um cacti and succulents is yeah it's a it's evolved and I've kind of learned what I can or, or, or cannot grow so when I first joined the society, I had an absolute fascination for melocacti. Um, so I bought bought a few melocacti, you know, little seedly ones, and you know some of the ones you can get in um, Wilco's et al. And um, I killed them quite quick, really, um, because you know I I, I, was, uh, I was I was not actually watering them enough. Um, you know, they they, they 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 like a bit of they like a bit of moisture. Do do uh, melocacti? They like it warm. And so yeah, when I when I got my First little greenhouse, not a proper greenhouse, just kind of one of these pop-up things that you get from, yeah, from the DIY store, fifteen pounds, and um, I had quite a few deaths either on my on my windowsill, uh, and and I started to learn just just how actually there, there was a bit of a bit of a knack to it really, and how the importance of of looking into how the plants grow and where they grow, and initially maybe a little bit of a naivety about watering and things like that just for those of us who are not familiar with the genus melocactus can you tell me a bit about them melocactus i, be- I believe it stems from um well they get nicknamed um, melon cactus as well and essentially you've got kind of yeah big round body and so as they grow they've got this big round spiky body and they they kind of look like a, a typical globular cactus and then as they become kind of adults so to say from their center they produce this thing called a cephalium and uh, what this is is this essentially kind of a cylinder that grows from the the center of the cactus, and it's often uh, a color such as red or white, and that's from from where the plants flower. So they're quite they're quite different in comparison to a lot of other cacti because the adults, so to say, are, and the babies look very different. Whereas you know if you grow um, you know an Echinocactus grassonii, you know you can see mother and child how they look quite similar. Whereas this, they look very certain way when they're young. And then, yeah, as they uh, reach maturity and get to flowering age, they form this, this what we call cephalium, this kind of this red kind of uh, blob coming out the top of them. And so, yeah, they're they're from places like Cuba and Brazil, and they, you know, they they they, they love the heat. You can even get them on beaches and things like that. And you know, if, if you take them much below kind of ten degrees Celsius, they will die quite quickly and quite easily. Quite a lot of melocacti are um, endangered because you know, only the you know your, your big adults can start flowering and throwing out seed and so if you, if you get you know those wiped out you've then got to wait quite a lot of years before you've got kind of a generation that can produce seeds and, and seedlings onwards from that so yeah that, that that was one example of kind of yeah I, I wasn't I wasn't watering mine enough or I'd let them go to I don't think oh, oh they'll be they'll still be okay in the you know the little polytunnel I had outside because it's, it's, it's only September it's only October I'll, I'll bring them in when it's really cold and uh, and they lose their roots. They you get to them and, and they've lost their roots. And I now I'm a lot better than growing them now. You know I have them inside. But this really shaped kind of the kind of plants I was I was growing. And from then I was I was a lot more particular about yeah just finding things that were going to be particularly cold hardy. Uh, I don't heat in my greenhouse at all. I'm also relatively limited for space. I, I don't have a huge collection. My, my greenhouse is uh, six foot by four foot. And so again this is kind of really guided the kind of plants I grow. So Things that aren't in a rush to be, um, you know, filling a, a five-inch pot anytime soon. So I grow lots of, yeah, cold-hardy plants. So 
things from the American plains, things that will take some frost like Echinoceris and things like that. I saw a discussion, I think it was on the BCSS Facebook group, about growers who have heated their greenhouses in past winters, looking at that again in the light of the way fuel bills are going up at the minute. I wonder how that's going to affect the hobby in future. That's definitely the case. I've spoken to members who have yeah energy bills yeah, going into the, the several hundreds of pounds and and um the, the cost of energy is certainly whether we like it or not is certainly going to force certainly how we grow our plants you know I, I i do have quite a few plants that aren't cold hardy and that I, I move into the house over winter but that's you know that's a lot more limited space you know it's just some windowsills etc uh, rather than a whole greenhouse and um and yeah you know i think you know if you're growing Brazilian plants or you know plants some different types of plants from the Caribbean etc uh, yeah you, you can you can or, or African euphorbias things like that uh, pseudolithos as well like they, they need a lot of heat you know 10 15 degrees celsius which to, to heat a greenhouse that is going to be astronomical in price these plants are quite often i find a, a lot more cold hardy than maybe we initially think like there's originally when i started my cold hardy greenhouse i thought it was you know just going to be you know uh, some apuntia and some echinoceros and things that were definitely kind of tried and tested could go down to minus 15 um, and that was your lot kind of really but really i find that as a general rule um clack clack in particular um and a lot of lithops i have taken through you know many winters now completely unheated i think there's a lot to be said about ventilation my greenhouse is is quite small but that means that you know when i have you know if if a clear day comes along in in the autumn or the winter i'll throw that door open i'll put the the window open and there's a lot of air movement and i think that's really if not more important than 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 temperature the movement of air so i think you can have a real good play around with your conditions and you'd be surprised yeah just just what can survive really i think people think lithops look terribly sort of fragile somehow and want to sort of bring them inside but certainly i mean i don't have many i think i've got one or two and um ones i've grown from seed and i was thinking gosh they're so tiny having been grown from seed but actually they were absolutely fine they've been fine outside and uh, as you say it's more about air circulation and also what's going on with the roots in terms of dryness i think that you can um do things you can do to to make sure they'll have their best chance of surviving i guess wet is the enemy (laughs) with many of them yeah and yet sometimes i break the fundamental the golden rule in growing cacti unheated in the greenhouse and uh, so there's a couple of species in particular so um for example my classic cactus straussii that you know big silver torch uh, kind of cactus that you you come across in garden centers etc um, I'll give that a bit of water in in January, and it'll keep its roots and it'll keep its growing point. Um, there's a beautiful cactus, Mammillaria luthii. It's one of my, I think it's my favourite cactus species. It's this incredibly small. Um, it's got this very black body with these long tubercles, white on the end, and they have these gorgeous um, purple flowers. And I give them a you know a sprinkle of water in February, even if it's you know cold and they pull through and certainly for anyone listening i I wouldn't i would not use that as a general yardstick but um do have a talk to people and and see if there are any particular requirements and if there are any kind of exceptions to the rules in terms of watering in the winter what's your vision for the future of the bcss i I kind of want to build on on what has been started in in taking the society keeping the very essence of the society like you know things that work incredibly well in the society there's a beautiful journal um you know the the you know the the shows that are put on by the shows committee and and other uh, branches or zones throughout the country are are phenomenal. Uh, you know the, the organisation involved is fantastic. Um, but find ways of of, of, yeah, of bringing this to a, a wider audience. So particularly for me, it's showing how we fit in as a, as a modern society into a world where you can easily go on Facebook. Or on on Instagram or on Google and, and get information of plant at the click of your fingers for free and show how we are set apart from that in in being able to offer you know a more personal experience and often a far more knowledgeable experience than if you just you know Google, Googled a plant and so in the first few months and you know, the first year or so I really want to kind of 
yeah, focus on the out, outward facing aspects of our society, kind of get in order how we can align with with, with, with other kind of mod, modern charities uh, and, and how they run things. Uh, in, sort out a website that means that we can, you know, when people Google us, they come across, you know, a, f- a fresh website um, that kind of in, in, entices them in and introduces them to our society. I think I want to kind of to, to forge links and really showcase what we have offer on offer in terms of kind of our our charitable objectives. You know, we, we are a charity. Uh, you know, and we have to be very very um, wary of of what our our purpose is. You know, to, to spread awareness of, of cultivation and, and and research and conservation and and reach out to, you know, for example, university students who might not be aware of the travel grants that we, we offer or the ability to apply to the BCSS to run your own conservation project on, on cacti succulents. Fundamentally, I, I don't want to change what the society is about, which is you know, people enjoying plants and being able to pass on, well, to garner huge amounts of information from incredibly experienced members. Um, but yet, yeah, through our just our public-facing aspect of that, kind of attract them and, and let them know that, that we are here and, you know, that, you know, hopefully... In the future, you know, when you talk to people at an RHS show or at a garden centre or your local plant swap or on Facebook, people know we exist and there. That's not the first time that they've heard of us and that we've managed to kind of get out there and, and, and spread the word that we are, you know, a useful and productive force in, in horticulture and, and the cactus and succulent world. If you were trying to pitch to somebody the idea of, joining the BCSS, how would you say and describe in a couple of sentences what you get from becoming a member? I think joining the BCSS, it's the perfect marriage of yeah, the hobby that you're already interested in, uh, in a topic, you know, in a group of plants that are inherently fascinating. You know, it's a lot easier to entice people in with cacti and succulents than it is with, you know, uh, pine trees or, um, you know, ferns. I, I, I'm sorry to, for the fern lovers out there, but um, I, 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 I do believe that is true. <laughs> fern lovers switching Indeed. off. Sorry, uh, <laughs> your, your ratings have dropped by ninety percent. I'm sorry. Um, and but, but I think yeah, the, the key bit is the the personal, you know, the, the personal um, human aspects of being part of yeah, a community of growers, and I think that is what sets us apart from words just written on websites you know you can you know after the horrible years last couple of years we've all had i think people are more ready than ever to actually you know to to turn off the tv and 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 see see people in real life and and, and do real things together and i think perhaps before the pandemic there was there's certainly this slide towards you know is is everything going to be online and we just you know go home after working the nine to five and and just consume uh, media through whatever source that is, and and I think, I think the society offers a real, yeah, opportunity for people to have have fun and feel part of a community, uh, whether, yeah, yeah, a community uh, to enjoy these plants, and ultimately I think you people will learn and do learn a lot more if they're involved in that kind of, you know, if, if you've got friends in the hobby and you know you're looking forward to your you know, your branch meeting or your next show or your next. Um, your next Zoom talk discussion, you know, just because things are online, I, I, I do want to stress, just because things are online does not does not make them um, inherently bad in any way, and that you can still get a lot of social interaction from things like your branch Zoom meetings, and I think they're a real um, lifeline to kind of people, particularly some members who maybe hadn't used things like Zoom before the society, um, the pandemic came along, and they were still able to see their friends and talk to them face-to-face about a, a topic they loved, and I think that's kind of um, yeah, what sets us apart from, as I said, just something that isn't a specialist kind of yeah, plant society. Just on a, a final note, if somebody's listening to, to this and thinking, well, I'm not really into cacti and succulents, I'm not really that kind of grower, is there one succulent that you can say to people, this can be your gateway drug to the world of cacti and succulents. Is there something that you believe nobody can resist because it's just the best 
thing to grow. I'm putting you on the spot there. I know what I would answer if, if I was going to answer this question, but I'd love to hear what you think. Wow. Uh, this really is a task. Um, well, let me tell you what I, my one is, and then you, that gives you some thinking time, because I haven't given you this question beforehand. Um, I think the one that really is a showstopper for me is one that lots of people kill, but I still think it's absolutely fascinating. And it's uh, Senecio Rolianus, mm. the string of beads or string of pearls i mean i I, i'm biased because i've written a chapter of my upcoming book about this plant but i just think it's just it looks amazing it's got amazing habits and you just can't fail to look at it and and find it fascinating so so for me although i know a lot of people moan that they find it difficult to keep alive for me that one is an absolute showstopper and i i am eyeing up the variegated form at the moment because it seems to be becoming a lot more widely available and wondering if I should add it to my collection but I suspect it's probably slightly more difficult than Mm. the plain green one so I'm slightly hesitant (laughs) has that given you time to have a have a think about your one I think what truly got me hooked is what is is not necessarily even my my favorite plant now but what really kind of blew me away when I had those first few plants, is we had this. It was um, Echinopsis oxygona, and you see you, you, you see them a lot, uh, just kind of generally around. You might see them in takeaway windows, etc. And most of the year, it just is this green ball with some spikes on. It's not the most showy, and then over a course of around a week, it will produce a flower of absolute magnificent proportions uh you know sometimes the trumpet can be kind of you know, nearing a foot long it opens out into this pinky white flower and the smell is, is fantastic and just just seeing you know the, 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 there's, there's not many house plants in which you see such rapid you know production of a flower um it flowers it doesn't flower for long and then it dies down that was one of the things that got me hooked it was just such a spectacle uh, I think that's really special. And I think mm-hmm. for someone wanting to get involved, um, kind of get hooked to that gateway drug, I think something getting a plant that is going to reward you relatively reliably with flowers is very nice. It gives you that visual reward. And for quite a lot of people, to start off with, they're not... You know, there, there's, when I was starting off, there was a few plants I'd say, oh, that was that's looking nice, yeah. And then I'd realise a few months later, it was, it's been dead for a while. It was hollow on the inside. And, you know, at least, you know, with a flowering plant, you know... So, <laughs> Something like rebutia, like rebutias, they're nice and cold hardy. They'll take quite a bit of stick, really, uh, and they'll produce enormous amounts of, you know, of, of very colourful. You've got all these wonderful hybrids, pinks, yellows, purples, reds, everything. Um, I think, yeah, something like that will will produce flowers quite reliably um, in, yeah, in quite immense numbers. Um, yeah, it's kind of the kind of way of, of getting you in, and, and yeah, something you can really kind of watch and fold before you. I don't have Echinopsis oxygona, but I do have Subdenudata, which is the, I think it's sometimes called the Domino cactus or the Easter lily cactus. I mean, I love the flower on that, which is a white one. I always think it smells like personal washing laundry liquid, laundry powder. I'd agree with that, yeah. I don't know what oxygona smells like, but I agree with you. Those dramatic flowers, bang for your buck. You are getting plenty Mm. of it with that. And you can really enjoy those flowers. What I will say just about them as one last point is is that they're relatively nocturnal. And so when you come home from work, that's actually when it's coming into its own. um, Because, yeah, they're pollinated by things like moths but yeah that's yeah that's 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 another kind of another thing about them is that you know when you're coming from work you've still got the flowering to come well you can have it you can have a flowering party where you know you sit up all night looking at your beautiful <laughs> beautiful i I know people who've done that with the queen of the night um which is a uh, uh, one of the the forest cacti uh you know staying up all night watching it flower i mean like who needs tv what a show yeah (laughs) well it's been great to talk to you greg thank you so much for chatting to me and i'm really excited to see where the bcss ends up going and i also thank you for stepping up because i know that doing these kind of roles for a charity like uh, a plant society is hard work and there's always going to be people um you know who want you to pull you in different directions so i'm sure it's going to be uh, a lot of hard work but best of luck with your tenure as chairman thank you very much jane thank you so much for having me on your podcast day it's uh, the first time i've been interviewed for a podcast so it's quite an honor
Oh, great. Well, I'll put all the details in the show notes for um, how to join the society and all that jazz. It's great value. I should also say it's really good value. I think it's, is it still about £15? Is, am I right there or am I out of date? Um, it's a really good value membership. Th- that, that is, that is the, the current price, yes. Yeah, it's great value. And the, as you say, the journal is superb. So I always encourage listeners to to have a look at joining plant societies. They are absolutely brilliant resources. And so it's wonderful to see the BCSS starting a new chapter. Thank you very much. Do go and check out the show notes at janeperone.com for all the names of those cacti, if you missed any. And you know me, I had to go straight away and find out whether that cephalium, the dome-like structure on the top of the mellow cactus genus, serve a particular purpose. I'll link to the wonderful blog post I found by former guest of the show, Matt Candeus, on In Defence of Plants, a really detailed blog post all about cephalium. Basically, it's a very concentrated flower factory for the plant. It doesn't photosynthesize and it has very and it has a very tightly packed spines which protect both the flowers and the fruit that follows from anything that might want to eat them. So I'll post that link to the cephalium or should I say cephalia in the plural page from Matt Candeus to find out more about these amazing structures if you wish to do so. And now it's time to hear from our Meet the Listener subject this week. My name's uh, Andrew Atkinson. When did you get into houseplants and why? I got into houseplants in 2021, so I'm a, a bit of a newbie. And I got into houseplants following the very sudden death of my fiance, following her having a stroke. Friends kept taking me to the garden centre for a coffee, and whilst there I purchased my first plant, which was a Tradescantia Nanook. What's the latest addition to your houseplant collection? My latest houseplant purchase was a Geo Gananthus. Uh, she's beautiful and dark and smouldering and doing very little at the moment. Complete the sentence, I love my houseplants because... I love my houseplants because they brighten up the house. They give me a focus and now I have plants inside that are equally as beautiful as my azaleas, rhododendrons and roses outside. Who is your houseplant hero? My houseplant hero is Talassa Crusoe. I bought her book following a podcast from On The Ledge. It may be old, but it's bang up to date in so many ways. Name your plantagonist. The plant you simply cannot get along with. My houseplant plantagonist is Ponsetta. Ultimately, I just treat them as disposable these days. My other plantagonist is my Alacasia dragon scale. We have a love-hate relationship, but we're currently in a love phase because she's put out a beautiful new leaf in the last couple of weeks. Thanks so much, Andrew. And I have to say, anyone who comes on Meet the Listener and puts himself forward deserves our praise because it's not easy recording your own voice. I know this. I've been doing it for a long time now and it's still not easy. It takes a lot of bravery. And so anyone who puts themselves forward for Meet the Listener, well done. Anyone can do it. I'd love to hear from you. And it makes you feel really good when you've done it. So if you want to be featured in this slot drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com that is all for this week's show i will be back next friday have a fantastic week join a plant society why don't you see you next friday bye music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by The Joy Drops The Road We Used to Travel When We Were Young by Komiku Chiefs by Jazar and I Snossed I Lost by Dr. Turtle 
The ad music was Dill Pickles by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit the show notes for details.